there's a thing that happens in that town, in that area, where the the people that think outside of the norm say it in like whispered hush tone. Joe Rogan has always been vocal about the shady side of Hollywood and how it blackballs its actors after they refuse to conform to its ways. And it seems he might be right. So let's have a look at seven actors who got blackballed by Hollywood at the heights of their careers. Sylvester Stallone. Let's be realistic here. You can't make peace with someone who's been so, so nefarious in my in my opinion so like horrible stallone starred opposite michael b jordan in creed and creed 2 even earning an oscar nomination for supporting actor thanks to his role in the 2015 first installment but what shocked many was stallone's absence from creed 3. while rocky's name gets name dropped a couple times in the script his whereabouts are never explained Stallone's absence in Creed 3 marked the first time in nine films in 47 years that a movie in the Rocky film franchise did not feature Rocky Balboa. The reason behind Stallone's departure was twofold. He wasn't the biggest fan of Creed 3's creative direction and his clash against longtime franchise producer Erwin Winkler. Creed 3, scripted by Keenan Coogler and Zach Balin from a story they cooked up with original Creed director Ryan Coogler, is a far darker take on the uplifting Rocky franchise. According to film critics, Creed the Three was a sports drama that feels more like a Cape Fear-inspired thriller than a traditional Rocky movie. That's a regretful situation because I know what it could have been, Stallone told THR about disagreeing with the sequel's tone. It was taken in a direction that is quite different than I would have taken it. It's a different philosophy, Erwin Winkler's and Michael B. Jordan's. I wish them well, but I'm much more of a sentimentalist. I like my heroes getting beat up, but I just don't want them going into that dark space. I just feel people have enough darkness. Anyway, Stallone's clash with Winkler was an even bigger reason for his absence in Creed 3, so big that it might mean Stallone never plays Rocky again. The two have long feuded over rights to the Rocky franchise, which Winkler has owned since the Oscar-winning 1976 original. Stallone naively sold Winkler the rights all those years ago when he was a struggling actor and clearly unaware of the franchise potential for the character. Speaking to Sirius XM host Jessica Shaw in November 2022, Stallone said it was a rough emotional ride cutting ties with the Rocky franchise for Creed 3. The actor added he needed to do so because you can't make peace with someone who's been so, so nefarious in my opinion. Stallone was referring to Winkler, of course. Stallone first opened up about his resentment over the Rocky rights in a 2019 interview with Variety. Although he earned net points on the original movie, which cost just over $1 million to produce and grossed $225 million globally, and received first dollar gross on the early sequels, Stallone does not maintain the rights to the characters. I have zero ownership of Rocky, Stallone told Variety at the time. Every word, every syllable, every grammatical error was all my fault. It was shocking that it never came to be, but I was told, hey, you got paid, so what are you complaining about? I was furious. The clash between Stallone and Winkler over Rocky rights was reignited in 2022. Stallone published an Instagram post in July featuring a portrait of Winkler as a knife-tongued serpent. A very flattering portrait of the great Rocky Creed producer Erwin Winkler from one of the country's greatest, Stallone wrote in the caption. After Erwin controlling Rocky for over 47 years and now Creed, I really would like to have at least a little of what's left of my rights back before passing it on to only your children. I believe that would be a fair gesture from this 93-year-old gentleman. A few weeks later, MGM announced it was developing a new Rocky spin-off movie centered on the Drago family. Dolph Lundgren starred as Rocky's Russian rival Ivan Drago in Rocky IV, while Florian Montianu debuted as Ivan's son in Creed II. Robert Lawton was hired to pen the script. Stallone spoke out publicly against the spin-off and said he was never told about its development. Another heartbreaker, just found this out. Once again, this pathetic 94-year-old producer and his moronic useless vulture children, Charles and David, are once again picking clean the bones of another wonderful character I created without even telling me, Stallone wrote on Instagram. I apologize to the fans. I never wanted Rocky characters to be exploited by these parasites. By the way, I have nothing but respect for Dolph, but I wish he had told me what was going on behind my back, Stallone added at the time. Keep your real friends close. Carl Weathers. Carl Weathers, forever etched in cinematic memory as the indomitable Apollo Creed, epitomized the archetype of the action hero. However, beneath the veneer of success lay a tale of confinement and missed opportunities. 
Weathers found himself shackled to roles that failed to tap into his full range as an actor, thanks to an industry eager to exploit his physicality for profit. Despite attempts to break free from this suffocating mold with projects like Action Jackson and the forgettable TV series Fortune Dane, Weathers remained ensnared, a victim of Hollywood's penchant for easy categorization. Meanwhile, black actors like Denzel Washington with strategic maneuvering and chameleon-like abilities emerged as a beacon of hope amid the industry's murky waters. Washington refused to be confined by narrow labels, deftly navigating between genres with finesse. From comedic outings like Carbon Copy to searing dramas like Glory, Washington's repertoire showcased his refusal to be boxed in, an audacious defiance of an industry hell-bent on typecasting. Yet lurking beneath the surface of Washington's success lies a disturbing truth, the industry's selective embrace of certain narratives and personas. While Washington's multifaceted talent earned him accolades and box office glory, one cannot ignore the systemic biases at play. Washington's broader appeal, particularly among female audiences, undoubtedly played a role in his meteoric rise, a convenient narrative for an industry eager to maintain its status quo. The glaring discrepancy in the reception of their respective starring vehicles further exposes Hollywood's fickle nature. Weather's ambitious endeavor, Action Jackson, floundered amidst tepid reviews and lackluster box office returns, relegating him to the sidelines. In contrast, Washington's films consistently found favor with audiences and critics alike, a testament not only to his talent, but also to the industry's willingness to champion certain narratives over others. Television, too, served as a battleground in the war for recognition and relevance. Weather's sporadic forays into the small screen yielded mixed results, highlighting the industry's reluctance to fully embrace his talent beyond fleeting moments of success. Meanwhile, Washington's brief dalliance with television in St. Elsewhere served as a mere footnote in his illustrious career, a testament to his ability to transcend the limitations imposed by an industry rife with biases and preconceptions. But despite it all, Carl Weathers wasn't one to sit by and watch other actors get blacklisted by the industry. You see, former Mandalorian vet Gina Carano wrote a warm, lengthy tribute to her fellow Disney Plus Star Wars series co-star Carl Weathers on Instagram. Carano, who was not welcomed back for a third season of The Mandalorian or any other Star Wars spin-off in the wake of making controversial comparisons in February 2021 about a divided U.S. to Nazi Germany, said that Weathers called me directly after I was fired. Carano played bounty hunter Cara Dune for two seasons on The Mandalorian, while Weathers portrayed bounty hunter agent turned later High Magistrate of Navarro Grief Karga. Weathers also directed nine episodes of The Mandalorian and was nominated for guest actor in a drama series for the 2020 episode Chapter 12, The Siege. I wasn't in an emotional state where I could pick up the phone because of how upset I was, but we did end up speaking later on, she wrote about hearing from Weathers post her Disney dismissal. He was gentle and encouraging and didn't want me to give up. He was letting me know that he wasn't throwing me away. He was trying to keep my hope alive in what seemed like quite hopeless scenario. He showed me he cared. That is who he was. I bonded with him very closely on Mando season one and two, writes Carano. John Favreau felt he would be a good mentor for me because we shared the athlete turned actor bond. So John had him direct my first episode in season two of Mando. I believe had we gotten to Rangers of the New Republic, Carl would have directed me in much more. John F was right. We were a great fit. Carl was a mentor to me on set. He would put both his arms on my shoulders and look me directly in the eyes to calm my spirit, she expounded on IG. He had a wonderful perspective of telling a story that can only come through his experience and wisdom that he shared with me to help make me shine. I cherish those moments. Wesley Snipes Wesley Snipes was the man who totally owned the 90s with his K performances and flicks like New White Men Can't Jump and the Blade Trilogy. This guy had charisma for days and a vibe on screen that was just, well, next level. However, his Hollywood journey took an unexpected turn when he found himself entangled in a serious tax evasion case spanning from 1999 to 2001, during which he allegedly dodged paying a staggering $7 million in taxes. Now, let's be real, it's likely Snipes would have willingly paid his taxes had he known the repercussions he would face. But alas, the government came down on him like a ton of bricks, using his high-profile status as a lesson to deter others from similar tax evasion practices. Turns out, Wesley got caught up in some bad advice from his accountant and this anti-tax advocate duo who were all like, hey, you don't actually have to pay taxes, man. 
I mean, who wouldn't be tempted by that idea, especially when you're pulling in around $40 million in a few years? But here's the kicker. Those so-called advisors ended up getting slammed with tax fraud and conspiracy charges, while Wesley got hit with three misdemeanor counts for failing to file his returns. In 2008, Wesley faced the music. He got handed a three-year sentence and ended up cooling his heels at the McKean Federal Correctional Institution, a medium security joint in Pennsylvania. He finally caught a break when the Federal Bureau of Prisons quietly gave him the boot on April 2, 2013. But let's back it up a bit. See, things could have been a whole lot worse for him. The big win? He dodged a bullet when he was acquitted of the heavy-duty charges of felony tax fraud and conspiracy. Instead, he got hit with some misdemeanor charges because he didn't exactly file his tax returns the way he was supposed to. But hey, Snipes wasn't about to take it lying down. Nope, he decided to appeal, arguing that his three-year stretch behind bars was way too harsh. Oh, and he threw in the race card too, claiming he couldn't catch a fair break in court because of his skin color. But even with all that, the US Supreme Court was like, sorry dude, no dice. Now let's talk about the nitty gritty of his charges. See, Snipes got slapped with a misdemeanor for failing to file his taxes, which is a far cry from the felony territory of filing false returns. Here's the deal. If you're making bank, you gotta cough up your fair share to Uncle Sam, no ifs, ands, or buts. But Snipes got sucked into this bogus theory floating around in tax protester circles that basically says, you only gotta pay taxes on money you make outside the good old US of A. Sounds wild, right? That's cause it is. And messing around with the IRS on stuff like this? Well, let's just say it's like playing with fire. They don't take too kindly to it. In fact, getting tagged with the label frivolous by the IRS is pretty much like getting the scarlet letter of taxes. It's bad news bears, my friends. And for Snipes, well, it landed him in some serious hot water, complete with a side order of jail time. Now, he recently spilled some wisdom in an interview with The Guardian. He was talking about his time behind bars and how it changed him. He said, I hope I came out a better person. But he didn't stop there. Snipes went on to say that being locked up actually helped him see things more clearly. Like he got a better grip on his values, his purpose in life, and even his connection with his ancestors and the higher powers. He's all about not wasting time now. Being away from his fam and friends for two and a half years really hit home for him. He said, the biggest thing I got from it was learning the value of time and how we often squander it. Snipes isn't playing the blame game, nope. He's owning up to his choices. He admitted that he's the one who picked his accountant and lawyer, and he's the one who chose to believe what they were selling. That was on me, he said. Despite all the craziness, Snipes sees it as a learning experience. He's all about growth and evolving from the situation. He said, I've gained so much more. I understand so much more. And if a couple years of meditation and self-reflection were part of his journey, he's cool with it. But unfortunately, his time behind bars marked a serious timeout from the acting scene and the public eye. Suddenly, the buzz wasn't about his K performances, but about the legal drama overshadowing his career. It goes to show how fame can get shaky real quick, especially when off-screen stuff takes the spotlight. Upon his release, Wesley tried to get back in the game. He showed up in films like The Expendables 3 and Coming to America. A comeback attempt, no doubt. But let's be real, it wasn't the full-on return to glory he probably hoped for. Hollywood can be a tricky beast, and Wesley Snipes learned that the hard way. Now here's the deal, Wesley's tax shenanigans definitely played a big role in his career taking a nosedive. But hey, he owned up to it and felt genuine remorse about the whole mess. And bet that after all that legal and financial drama, he'd definitely be extra careful about who he listens to when it comes to taxes. But here's where things get messy. Despite Wesley trying to move on and make amends, Hollywood seems to keep giving him the cold shoulder. It's like everywhere he turns, they're bringing up his past mistakes. Some folks think it's totally unfair. I mean, who hasn't messed up before, right? But nope, Hollywood seems more interested in the drama than his talent. Cat Williams, Micah, Cat Williams, the American stand-up comedian and actor, has always stood out from his peers in his blunt and radical beliefs regarding the mechanics of the entertainment industry. His breakout role as Money Mike in Friday After Next skyrocketed his career to phenomenal heights. However, there were certain demands that came with being an A-list comedian that Cat was unable to keep up with. One of them was being forced to wear a dress. In a recent interview, he revealed that he had a tense encounter with Martin Lawrence, who tried to make him wear a dress for a movie role. Williams said that he was offered a part in Lawrence's film Big Mama's House 2, but he turned it down when he found out that he had to dress up as a woman. He claimed that Lawrence was not happy with his decision and tried to pressure him into doing it. He said, come on, man, it's just comedy. It's not that serious. It's not like you're really a woman. 
I said, no man, I'm not doing it. I have principles and I have dignity. I don't want to disrespect myself or my people. He said, well, you're missing out on a big opportunity. You could be a star. I said, I'm already a star. I don't need to wear a dress to be funny. Williams said that he respects Lawrence as a comedian and an actor, but he does not agree with his choice of wearing dresses for laughs. He said that he believes that Hollywood has an agenda to emasculate black men and make them look weak and foolish. I'm not saying that every black man who wears a dress is selling out, but I'm saying that there is a pattern and a purpose behind it. They want to make us look like clowns and buffoons. They want to take away our masculinity and our power. They want to make us lose our identity and our self-respect. Adding to the revelations, Williams exposed the existence of a secret society named the Illuminati, which faces strong opposition from within the black community. It appears The Guardian has also indirectly backed his claim about the Taboo Society by revealing the society's name and its major members. It is the most elite club in the world. This is the Good Club, the name given to the tiny global elite of billionaire philanthropists. The names of some of the members are familiar figures. Bill Gates, George Soros, Warren Buffett, Oprah Winfrey, David Rockefeller, and Ted Turner. But there are others too, like business giants Eli and Edith Broad, who are equally wealthy but less well-known. Although Williams revealed the key aspects of the agenda that allegedly originated from the elites, he does warn other black artists to be careful of the club's clutches. It's not uh, necessary for us to store up that hornet's nest unless we intend to get stung a million times. Cat insists his intended audience should take his advice because he knows best, as he has allegedly been on the receiving end of the said sting for years. I didn't understand that. They had to sting me a million times. I'm still not going to join, but I respect it a little more. According to Cat, he wasn't the only one facing adversities, so he had to let it go for the sake of his own good. So I know how much they talked about Martin Luther King, and I know what they end up doing to him. I know this same story about Jesus and a few of my uncles. After suffering for a long time, William said he came to the stark realization that his outspoken temperament, coupled with his brutal truth-telling and airing out grievances, has subjected him to intense backlash. Even though he didn't anticipate the level of hostility directed towards him, it has definitely broadened his horizons. Now he has finally understood that his irresponsible actions are manipulated and used against him, and the elusive Illuminati reaps all the benefits from this situation. Monique. Monique has spent over a decade calling out Lee Daniels, Oprah Winfrey, and Tyler Perry, claiming they worked together to blackball her for not doing promotional press for the 2009 film Precious. The real beef kicked off when Oprah and Tyler decided Monique should hit the press circuit for the film without any paycheck. Monique wasn't having it and straight up said, nah, not in my contract. According to Monique, she only got a measly 50K for the whole movie, which was barely enough. Now they wanted her to jet around the world promoting the film for free, not on Monique's watch. But Oprah and Tyler didn't take her refusal well at all. Instead, they started trashing her reputation in the industry, spinning a narrative about her being difficult to work with. Monique spilled the tea saying Tyler Perry told her, you may want to consider promoting this film because if you get nominated for an Oscar, your next film is three to five million dollars. And if you win it, your next film is six to eight million dollars. Monique was like, hold up, I'm a black woman. Where are they paying those salaries, brother? She straight up told Tyler, I can't work for free. I've done what I was supposed to do. I can't go overseas and do this for free. Their back and forth continued, with Tyler saying he doesn't believe in giving money away for free, and Monique firing back, I don't believe in working for free. So we on the same page? It's a classic case of clash in values, and Monique wasn't backing down. He goes on about his spill, you know. I said, well, listen, you can write me the check for me to go overseas. I don't care where the money comes from, but I'm not going to do it for free. He says, well, I don't believe in giving money away for free. I said, I don't believe in working for free, so we're on the same page. She also claimed Tyler Perry allegedly went the extra mile to mess with her acting gigs. According to Monique, it all went down after she turned down a request to fly to France for the Cannes Film Festival tied to promoting the movie Precious. So check it. The movie studio initially asked her to jet off to France, but Monique, with her busy schedule as a talk show host, comedian, and family woman, respectfully declined. 
They tried to sweeten the deal by offering to upgrade her hotel room, but she and her husband stuck to their guns saying, nah, we're gonna spend this time with our family. When the third call came and they asked, what's it gonna take to get Monique to France? Her husband straight up asked, is there a number associated with it? That's when they dropped the bomb that they would never pay for anyone to do promotions for a movie. Monique revealed she was paid a mere $50,000 for Precious, and it wasn't about the money. She signed up to do it with her friend. The interviewer dug in suggesting she needed the money to feed her family and pay bills, and Monique responded, I think that's what America says. We all say, I can't do it for free. She explained that when the movie studio refused to pay for her Cannes appearance, they didn't make a fuss. But then the report started flying, painting Monique as demanding and difficult. The whole thing boiled down to a simple request that they understood couldn't be met. But suddenly, Monique found herself labeled, and that's where the drama kicked in. Charlie Sheen. Remember when Charlie Sheen was ruling the TV screens and pulling in a mind-boggling $1.8 million for just one episode of Two and a Half Men back in 2010? Crazy, right? But somehow, somewhere along the line, he hit rock bottom. Charlie Sheen found himself knee-deep in a dire financial crisis, with a measly $10 million to his name. Now, to most regular folks, that still sounds like a hefty chunk of change, but for a guy who used to rake in a jaw-dropping $1.8 million per episode, it's a bit of a reality check. He even went as far as asking to slash his child support payments, citing a drought in steady work and being essentially kicked out of Hollywood's VIP club. You know, the term blacklisted in Tinseltown carries some serious weight, and Sheen's claiming he got slapped with that label. But it's not because he was on the wrong side of some political debate or anything like that. According to one bigwig studio exec spilling the beans to Deadline back in 2011, Sheen basically became uninsurable. That means nobody wanted to touch him with a 10-foot pole because they couldn't guarantee he wouldn't go off the rails again. And remember when Sheen's life took a nosedive and his CBS show, Two and a Half Men, went on hiatus? That was back in January 2011. Dude checked himself into rehab, battling his demons of alcohol and substance AB, making it his umpteenth stint in rehab. Plus, there were those troubling accusations of DV swirling around. Then, to top it all off, Sheen, who was raking in the big bucks as the highest paid TV star of the time, decided to go all in, demanding a whopping 50% raise. But he didn't just stop there. Oh no, he also publicly threw shade at the show's co-creator Chuck Lorre, which basically sealed his fate. Chucking Sheen off the show became a no-brainer for the higher-ups. After that messy breakup, rumors swirled about Sheen finding a new comedy gig, but insiders were as skeptical as ever. So, there's this whole chatter going on about whether there's more to Charlie Sheen's Hollywood exile than meets the eye. You know, his wild escapades are pretty much etched in stone, but even before he was ranting about tiger blood, he wasn't exactly a walk in the park to work with. Back in the golden days of Two and a Half Men, his co-star John Cryer spilled some beans. According to Cryer, things kicked off all rosy, with Sheen supposedly two years clean when the series first hit the screens. But then, bam, Denise Richards files for divorce in 2005, and by the time season two rolled around, both Sheen and Cryer were freshly single. Cryer spilled the tea in his 2015 memoir, So That Happened, revealing that Sheen took a nosedive into the dark side. By the time 2010 rolled in, filming became a real struggle. Cryer painted a picture of Sheen looking like he'd just wrestled with a grizzly bear, gaunt, pale, and sweating bullets. And his acting? Well, let's just say it started to resemble a cheesy soap opera. Lines were forgotten more often than not, and Sheen's balancing act on set sometimes involved clutching onto furniture for dear life. Warner Bros. jumped into the fray, backing up these claims, saying Sheen's antics were like tossing a grenade into an already tense atmosphere on set. Sheen eventually entered rehab in 2011, and the show went on hiatus to give him the time he needed. That's when things really fell apart. When Sheen declared he was clean and ready to rock again, production didn't jump back on board. And you can bet your bottom dollar Sheen wasn't having any of it. He went all out, pointing fingers at the show's creator, Chuck Lorre, and threw enough shade to cover the entire Hollywood sign. Sheen even went as far as calling Lorre some not-so-nice names in front of the whole TMZ crowd. He said, he's a stupid, stupid little man and a P-punk that I'd never want to be like. But things hit rock bottom when Warner Bros. officially gave Sheen the boot in March 2011. They didn't hold back, sending a hefty 11-page letter to Sheen's legal squad, spelling out exactly why they were handing him his walking papers. They didn't mince words, citing felony offenses, self-destructive behavior, and downright erratic conduct. It was like a laundry list of Sheen's greatest hits, trashing hotel rooms, DV charges, you name it. 
They also slammed, your client has been engaged in dangerously self-destructive conduct and appears to be very ill. The letter included numerous examples of Sheen's problematic behavior, like his ceaseless tirades against Lore, his refusal to enter rehab, his 2010 trashing of a plaza hotel room that caused at least $7,000 in damages, and his 2009 arrest on suspicion of DV. They also claimed that Sheen was missing rehearsals, forgetting his lines, refusing to collaborate with colleagues, and making inflammatory comments poisoning key working relationships. And Sheen? Well, he wasn't exactly waving a white flag. Nope, he doubled down, brushing off the whole ordeal like it was a minor inconvenience. He even took a jab at Lore and those silly shirts he had to wear on set. E said, now I can take all of the bazillions, never have to look at WS again, and I never have to put on those silly shirts. Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe hasn't set foot in the US for filming since 2019. The star of Gladiator, who now splits his time between his farm in Nana Glen, Australia and his Sydney apartment, explained that his American friends often question his absence from the US post-pandemic. My American friends are like, what's going on? He said during an interview on Two Day FM's Hughesy, Ed and Aaron Breakfast Show. Between 1992 and 2019, there wasn't a single year when the actor didn't make at least two trips to the US. However, after his last film in the US, the thriller Unhinged, the pandemic struck. I haven't been back since for a press tour, he explained. I've been able to wrangle a way to do most of the press sitting here on the phone on the farm. Over the past four years, Crow has filmed in Thailand, Malta, England, Ireland, and Australia. Now, in 2023, he revealed that he was considering winding up his career. At the 57th Karlovy Vary International Film Festival in Karlovy Vary, Czech Republic, he shared that he's contemplating retirement, according to Variety. You are standing in front of the mirror and go, who the F is that? He told journalists at the festival. I am in that period now. Crow weighed up his options, mentioning 85-year-old director Ridley Scott as an example of continuing to work as he ages. I will take Ridley Scott as my role model. He is still discovering new things in his work, Crow continued, or I will just stop and you will never hear from me again. These are two very valid choices. In any case, the fact that lots of actors get blacklisted in Hollywood is just a sign of how messed up things are there. Who knows how many more will suffer the same fate? Anyway, that's it for this video, folks. Bye.